Thank you very much, Udo Strohmeyer. We are grateful that you have been here, and we are grateful that you will be the one who will bring together again all regulators in a great panel tomorrow, where we are also very happy that IMI will be participating. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, people meeting people will never be replaced by Skype, will never be replaced by web seminars, and it will never be replaced by phone conferences. What we wish in these days for you is that you will make manifold contacts and that you will debate a lot together. And when you come home, as said you already yesterday evening, have made many friends at Klinam. I would like now to pass the word to Patrick Hunziker, who will give the opening lecture of this uh, meeting on the scientific side. Thank you very much. Dear colleagues, dear friends, I'm uh, happy to talk again about a rather self-critical view on what we have achieved in medicine, and I can allow me to do that as a, because I'm a medical doctor. Uh, let's start again with the vision and the mission of Cleanom Foundation. Cleanom Foundation is a non-profit organization, a foundation that has it as its goal to contribute to the medicine of the future. We are forward-looking. And we try to uh, achieve that by advancing nanomedicine and related sciences with the long-term goal of benefiting patients and our society. If we look with a critical eye on the achievements of the medicine of the 20th century, then we see great achievements. We see that we have recognized the causes of most diseases. We have found some spectacular therapies in some acute diseases. For example, in myocardial infarction, we have achieved a reduction of mortality of about 35% uh, in the first few days to about 6% in the first few days, which is certainly a great achievement. On the other side, uh, we have mixed achievements. For example, we transform many acute disease states into rather chronic disease states. So if you have acute heart failure, we are able to assure your survival in most cases. But now you have to live with chronic heart failure for years. So we transform acute disease into chronic disease. And this comes as a at a large expense of efforts of finances for the healthcare systems. We also have, to some degree, missed the relevance of individuality in medicine. We very often do not recognize the system view of man. Man as a complex, nonlinear system, which does not consist of a single parameter, but uh, uh, lives from an interaction of a large number of biologic aspects. We also have failed to cure a significant number of uh, diseases. We can cure cancer only in a minority of cases. We cannot cure heart failure. We cannot cure diabetes. We cannot cure hypertension. We can just treat it for decades. And we also have failed to eradicate diseases which seem to be amenable to eradication. Eradication might mean uh, no more cases in a society. We have recently done a survey of parasitic disease in school children in Congo, and we have found that about 90% of these children have invasive worm diseases leading to long-term health problems. And this is an eradicatable disease, which we don't just have not managed as a, a profession in medicine and as societies. And in the end, we have also to say that our advances in medicine are expensive. That means we are moving towards an economic and societal failure of healthcare. As soon as a state, a society, does not have 
the money to pay the very high prices we have now, uh, it risks to uh, deliver suboptimal care to the patient living in that society. And that means the agenda for the next century for medicine uh, can be defined as follows. We would like to build on knowledge. We would like to understand many things, and we would like to use this knowledge to cure major diseases. For example, as a cardiovascular doctor, I would like to cure atherosclerosis in a way that I recognize this problem, I treat it, and then I can send the patient home knowing that for 10 years he won't need medical attention and tablets for this disease. This could be considered a cure uh, uh, in some definition. We also would like to cure our African children for worms. We would like to cure hypertension such that it does not lead to stroke in the end and such that we do not need to treat somebody lifelong with drugs. We would like to eradicate malaria. We would like to eradicate uh, certain viral diseases which are a threat to our societies. And for that we need to uh, to achieve such goals, we need to understand personality. We need to personalize medicine. We need to understand the system aspects. And in particular, we need to find ways to do a cost-effective and high-quality approach to medicine in the future. Individualizing means that we need to understand the individual prognosis, the individual therapeutic benefits somebody has from getting a treatment, the individual toxicity, which can be expected in somebody, and also individual cost effic efficacy. We have a global responsibility. If you look at this chart showing the life expectancy worldwide, we see that uh, the blue countries have achieved a lot in terms of life expectancy for their inhabitants. The red countries are uh, much poorer, so uh, middle red means you have a life expectancy between 40 and 45 years, which is half of that what we see in Europe. And unfortunately, those countries who have those very low life expectancies are not the countries that can afford new technologies and new approaches to medicine. So what we need is a medical development which helps our societies, but at the same time is applicable in a very low uh, uh, very, very poorly developed areas and in very poor countries. And now this leads to the question of how we can achieve such uh, goals for healthcare. And that means how can we catalyze a transition to the medicine of the future? And my conviction is that we need to do that by building strong bridges. So the bridges are a central team of Cleanup Conference. You see that in our conference we have not only people coming from everywhere in the world, but they are also com coming from everywhere in scientific spe specialties and in non-medical non and non-scientific uh, uh, backgrounds. We need to be build bridges between the islands of, of science specialties which have evolved in the past. We need to build a bridge between academic research and clinical medicine. We need to build bridges between academia and industry. We need to build bridges between international communities. We need to build bridges with the science policy makers, regulatory bodies and societal stakeholders. And we need build to build bridges from north to south. So this is a large program, so we have a lot of work to do in the next, uh, in the future of, uh, of CLEANOM. Now let us come back to this rather dim view of the achievements of medicine. Why have we failed in certain aspects and how can we move forward? And this is a little bit the, back, uh, the background of uh, my presentation about knowledge-based medicine. Now, the smallest man in the world and the tallest man in the world and the smallest woman in the world and the tallest woman in the world, they have to say something to us. What is their message? Their message is that we know 
some things. We know from experience that each human is largely different. If you look to your neighbor, to the left or to the right, you can be assured that you are different in at least 29 million aspects from this neighbor. This is a large number of differences, and we know that it is very different from our lab mice. Our lab mice are inbred for 200 generations. They are very, very similar. And a lot of our medical development and research is built on lab mice. And that means our strategy for designing the medicine of the future needs to go beyond this concept of uniformity. It needs to take into account the really huge difference there are between individuals. And this certainly means we need to take into account the human genome. And many people kind of uh, use the term personalized medicine with an emphasis on measuring the genome of somebody. So the uh, simplified assumption is you measure, measure the genome, you know everything. But we also know that uh, this is not the full truth. We also know that non-genomic differences, for example, the emerging field of epigenetics, the impact of the environment, and last but not least, the, the observation of randomness during development also leads to a huge variability in individuals. So or even uh, homozygotic twins, they are very, very different at the molecular level because of these differences which go beyond the genome. And this is a limit of just measuring the genome for a personalized medicine and then knowing everything. It's not the full truth. We also know that once a di disease develops, there is a dynamic in this disease which leads to further variability. And there are in the meantime good data in the scientific literature which show us that as to some degree we need to abandon the idea of a disease as a disease class, as a, as a homogeneous entity. For example, in breast cancer, one of the big threats to women in our society, uh, we thought in the past that there is breast cancer. And then we learned that there are several kinds of breast cancer. And now we are learning based on an, an molecular analysis of these breast cancers that there are probably almost as many breast cancers as there are, are patients with breast cancer. So these uh, genetic differences in, uh, in cancer, they tend to uh, increase because uh, tumor cells are unstable cells. So we have to learn with the observation that each ca cancer is different. And this will have implications for the management of patients in the future. We have also learned from this study that the tools, genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics in individual patients is feasible. And these technologies are mainly based on nanotechnology advances. Further, we have learned that a disease is not the same over time. Actually, the old Greeks already knew it, Pantare, everything flows, uh, and that means we cannot just consider a myocardial infarction as a myocardial infarction or a breast cancer as a breast cancer, but we have to consider the phase, the timing of this disease. When does it occur in a patient and when do we detect it? And this timing of disease has fundamental, a fundamental impact on the prognosis of this patient and also on the effects of treatment. <coughs> We know that if you have a patient with suspected invasive infection in the hospital, if you achieve a treatment in the first hour, we can um, massively reduce the mortality compared to detecting this disease a few hours later. At the same time, we know from cardiovascular disease that uh, our concept of having randomized studies, for example, on the right side, you see the data from the so-called CURE study, one of the big studies that showed that strong platelet inhibi inhibition may reduce your risk in myocardial infarction is actually not a standardized effect, but what we see is that this therapy reduces the risk of ischemic event most at the time when the risk is highest, which is in the first month. However, the risk of bleeding of side effects of these drugs is more, it has a different distribution. And this effectually means that the benefit risk relation 
in medical treatment changes from day to day, from week to week, from month to month. This is something which we have not taken into account into our medical strategies in the past and we need to translate this knowledge into clinical practice. Now let's look at the evidence-based medicine. This is the big term in the last decade. Evidence-based medicine claims that we take the evidence and we treat the patient accordingly. Now the def definition we find in Wikipedia is evidence-based medicine means the strongest evidence for therapeutic interventions is provided by systematic review of randomized triple-blind placebo-controlled trials involving a homogeneous patient population and a homogeneous medical conditions. And evidently, such evidence-based medicine has a problem because there are just no homogeneous patient populations and no homogeneous medical conditions. Now, it's a good approach to medicine because for policymakers it's very simple. You don't need a doctor, you only need a biomarker, a flow sheet and a tablet. That means you have the standard patients, that is a black box, so you don't need a stethoscope, uh, you don't need to talk to the patient, and you have a standard disease, you need some classifier which tells you yes or no, and based on this binary information you either give the patient a tablet or a bypass operation. So this is a kind of uh, uh, the dummy approach to medicine, very simple, but maybe not fully adequate. In the future, we need to base medicine on the knowledge we have. So individuality of a patient, individuality of a disease, temporal aspects of a disease course needs to be taken in, into account. And this needs tools that are able to analyze uh, these states. Enabling technologies include analytical nanotechnologies. They include new imaging technology, technologies, which are to a significant part built on nanomaterials. And they need heavy use of computer science. So we already see this interdisciplinarity that is, that is really needed, that crosstalk between specialties that we try to foster at our conference to enable this future transition. Now, we also know a lot about uh, biological pathways. And the, this large poster is a, a reflector, reflects some of the experience the pharmaceutical industry has gained and is propagated by big industry, also by Roche. So we can find a multitude of pathways in the bodies. So it's not all the 25,000 proteins which are shown here on this slide, which we know that the human produces, but it's at least a significant part of it. And we, if, if we try to take the microscope and take one pathway out, we see these uh, blue labels. These are enzymes. And now industry means we can develop an inhibitor to one of these pathways. And this is the standard, the old approach to drug development. We choose a pathway, we design a small molecular inhibitor, we prove efficacy in cell culture and small animal models, we screen for toxicity, we choose a standard excipient, and we go to clinical trial and hope that this will be the next blockbuster, making up our pipeline. Now, it sounds simple, it costs more than a billion per drug reaching the market to do that, and it looks at the world of biology in a somewhat flat perspective. Uh, this is a flat image, and it can be applied to a human. Now, what do we know? We know that if people strain their musculoskeletal system a little bit too much, they may develop knee pain. For example, my son is uh, doing a little bit too much in body, uh, body strengthening, so sometimes he has pain somewhere. And then what you can do, you can take a painkiller tablet. Now, if you're unlucky, then you will develop hypertension, heart failure, gastrointestinal ulcer, kidney problems because of these painkiller tablets. And this already shows one of the problems with current pharmaceutical approaches. Uh, disease occurs at sites, and many of our drugs lack disease, the, the capability to target disease sites. And healthy tissues are often accessible to the drug and also to the side effects. We also know that uh, locations are very important in term determining mortality of cancer. 
So if you have cancer in the lung at a single location, you can cut it out, you have good chances to be healed. If you have a metastasis in the brain, that's a very bad uh, news for you or for us. We know that cancer tends to be encapsulated in certain regions which are very difficult to reach for the drugs, but still the rest of the body sees the drug and will develop the side effects. So we often do not reach the disease sites. And that means our medicine of the future, based on knowledge, needs to have better understanding of disease site specific features. What is the local biochemistry? What is the, uh, the matrix, the surrounding of a tumor? We need to target disease compartments specifically. We need to overcome biological barriers. And here again, we require uh, suited enabling sciences. And here the material science plays a very key role. So material sciences were a little bit uh, dis at distance from medicine in the past, but now they're really moving to the center of this uh, field. Also physics uh, have a very new meaning, nanobiophysics, understanding physical aspects in interaction of materials with the body play a new role. Functional molecular imaging for models and in particular in patients allow us to understand mo uh, molecular features of disease inside the body. The pharmaceutical science have new challenges and will be one of the key uh, technologies or, or key sciences to, uh, to help in this uh, developing of this new medicine. And toxicology also is, has uh, very new challenges. So what we need to do in the future, we need not only to identify new pathways to treating cancer, we need also to, uh, to find ways to target these organs, these disease sites, these cells with new technologies, targeting cells, targeting pathways, targeting tissues, new ways of targeting cancer, delivering drugs, not just applying it orally or intravenously, but bringing it to the disease, disease site, delivering things like nucleic acids, siRNA, and delivering functional materials, all topic of uh, this conference. So the old uh, field of small molecular drugs in pharma has been extended by bi biotech and will further expand into nanomaterials and finally into complex nanosystems. So we have a big challenge for uh, the mindset of pharmaceutical industries, they need to transform, to expand. And this is a challenge because they have established pathways for many things, but sometimes not for the nanomaterials and the system approaches. Now, filling these knowledge gaps is a real interdisciplinary challenge in academia as well as in industry. And as an example, I show here our research group. I would like to thank all those who participate in this group. And you already see this is a very mixed group of people. We have signal processing specialists, biomedical researchers, chemists, physicists, pharmaceutical uh, people with a pharmaceutical people uh, background, even a medical doctor. And uh, it's this kind of interdisciplinary interaction which needs to take place very early in research to be able to uh, avoid hitting the wall at the, the wrong timings in, during our developments. And one of the challenges is certainly that our universities are built in a different way. They are built with chemistry in one building, biology in another building, uh, computer science in yet another area of the city. Uh, so talking to each other on a daily basis is difficult and we need to find new, even new building types for such interdisciplinary research. One of the knowledge gaps if you apply nanostructures to life is that we don't fully understand if we build a polymer molecule, for example the one in red built by our, by our chemist, what happens to this molecule if it self-assembles to nanostructures. And that's why we have chosen a dual approach to this, we are on one way synthesizing libraries of such materials, we observe what happens in self-assembly, and then at the same time in dark red we do computer modeling to model, to simulate this self-assembly process. And from this dual approach on modeling using chemistry and doing 
computer science, on these materials we have learned a lot. We have found certain principles of self-assembly which will allow us in the future to do knowledge-based design of new materials where we do not need to go the long way of synthesizing zillions of molecules, but we can really be much more selective and uh, uh, targeted in what we are doing. The next knowledge gap is the knowledge gap between structure of nanosystems and biology. We have many data points for many, for many studies, but they are kind of dispersed in the universe and they are somewhat difficult to integrate in a common worldview. And that's why we have invested into a systematic endeavor of studying such materials and their behavior with cells. Here also we use modeling and combined with biomedical analysis. And what we have seen is that we find structural parameters, we find uh, structural parameters, for example here, what you see here is in black the length of the hydrophilic chain of a polymer. So in this nanosystem you have short chains, in this nanosystem you have longer chains, you already see that uh, long using just changing the length of the chains will change your size of the core due to physical effects. And we have seen that size and chemistry just of the outermost group will have a profi profi uh, profound impact on cell binding of such nanosystems which are otherwise very, very similar. And this has to do, on, uh, and this can also be learned from modeling. Here in modeling we see that uh, the chain length of our polymer increases. If you have a short chain length, the red dots are always the outermost, uh, at the outermost location of your system. Now if you increase the chain length, you have the random effects of coiling, and that means part of your outermost group will bend inwards and will be hidden from access to the outside. So in these molecules, uh, in these systems here, you see many blue points, which means that your functional group is not visible from the outside. So just changing one single simple parameter in your system profoundly changes the interaction of your nanosystem with cells. Then we have the knowledge gap of systematic and predictive nanomaterial physiology. And this is a project which was unfortunately not funded by the Swiss National Foundation because it was uh, considered too, too, uh, too demanding. What we are doing here is we are using a multi-dimensional approach to analysis of interaction of nanosystems with uh, biology. So we look at chemistry, we look at size, we look at uh, in mice at sex, we look at time, we look at organ distribution, and this is just a single example from a single polymer from the large library we have. And in these, uh, we look at the vari variability of side chains over time. And what we see is a, uh, a multidimensional map of differences in bio-nano interactions, which may really form some basic features from, for, a, for a rational design in the future. We will be able to design materials based on, on what we learn here in this endeavor. On the other side, we need now to look at the behavior of these materials in the whole body. And here we need to extend our existing uh, pharmacokinetic models, which we use to uh, look at uh, physical processes. What we also would like to learn is uh, to produce size uh, safety, not by chance, but by design. For example, we would like to abolish complement activation in our systems. We would like to understand the structure function relationship of complement activation of po uh, potential of nanomaterials. We would like to systematically understand what is the best carrier for a cancer. We would like to find new ways to combine stealth, targeting, SIRNA delivery, and this can be done with uh, such polymeric approaches, as you see here. And in the end, we would like to translate this to industry. That means do it in a controlled, reproducible, scalable way for production and loading to be able to enable industry to produce such materials. And that means for the politicians, we need characterization pipelines. This needs support from, uh, 
from the uh, political stakeholders, this needs toxicity strategies. For the regulators, this needs new regulatory frameworks, which are in the works here. And for the clinician, this need, meet, needs new uh, trial designs. If we know that there are no standardized patients anymore, what does this mean in design of new trials? So the, to summarize, the knowledge-based medicine of the future starts with understanding individual anatomy, anatomy and physiology. It uh, takes into account the genomic and molecular medicine approaches. It needs to learn from large data sets, imaging data sets, the data hidden in the large multicenter trials. It also takes into account the evidence-based medicine aspects as a subset of our knowledge. It looks at molecular targets pathways. It makes heavy use of novel materials. It needs to progress in nanobio interaction. And in the, the end, we hope really to have individual pro, uh, prediction of prognosis of disease course of efficacy, toxicity, those. And we need to uh, use this knowledge to make medicine more economic. So the medicine of the future, I hope, will lead to the knowledge-based medicine, curing major diseases, eradicating specific diseases, personalizing disease, understanding system aspects, being cost-effective and high quality uh, in an individual fashion. Thank you for your interest. Now, let's move to the, hmm, have a break. I would like to say something. Could all, could all speakers that will speak during these days go absolutely to the room uh, next to the registration to upload their presentations? Another point is that we are videotaping all these sessions. And should you not want to be a year from now in the internet on our website, you would have to fill in a form at the registration and let us know, and then we will exclude it. Thank you.